Good morning, everyone. Let's do that again and make sure you're really listening. Um, I'm Ian Bourne. I'm the media consultant for public affairs with the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy. We're streaming live from our headquarters at Charnox in Christchurch, and it's all part of our Bluefest week of activities. Every year, we've been celebrating Bluefest for the last two years, and we're now taking a new step in celebrating Bluefest, telling our story. With us in the studio, we have, of course, the Honorable Minister, Kirk Humphrey, who's also the parliamentary representative for St. Michael's South. And over to my left is Ricardo Ward, the climate change coordinator, along with Dr. Leo Brewster, the director of the Coastal Zone Management Unit. If that's a lot to say, you can shorten it by saying CZMU. Then to my immediate right, we have our chief technical officer, Jacqueline Blackman, our maritime attorney, Najla King, and our acting chief fisheries officer, Joyce Leslie. All of us are here to provide a view of what it is we do with the maritime affairs and the blue economy. And in further to that, in telling our story, don't forget to watch out on TV8 and our Instagram. We are on Instagram, M-M-A-B-E underscore double B. That's our IG signature. Now, the current administration, it's identified the blue economy as a significant driver for further national development. Many Barbadians are unaware of this concept. Minister Humphrey, what is your perspective and uh, view of the blue economy and going forward? And good morning. Right, good morning to you, Ian. Good morning to all. Good morning to the viewers. Good morning to the staff and to the technical team who are supporting us. Good morning as well. I, I just want to begin by saying, first of all, it is, it is a good thing and a timely thing to be able to have this conversation about the blue economy. And this really is an idea whose time has come. The truth is, um, you know, we are actually coming to the party in some ways a little bit late. And it is, it is good that we've been able to make up some ground over the last two years. When we started the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, I felt there were some things we had to focus on. And we created individual pillars which we figured were going to be very important as we go forward. And all of that must have been set within a renewable energy context and recognizing uh, a roof-to-reef -roof kind of reality. So what were some of those pillars? We said when we began the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy that we had to focus to a certain extent on maritime transport, marine transport. And in shipping, for example, over the course of this conversation, I'm sure Najla and, and Jackie are going to speak about a number of things we're now doing in shipping to bring Barbados into the 21st century to move us from a position where we are actually behind the rest of the region, putting us in front of the rest of the region. And there are very exciting things happening in shipping, of which I am, I am very pleased. We also felt we needed to look at our own physical development in a way. And by that I mean how do we build in relation to the fact that we are an exposed country, in relation to climate change, that almost every year you can guarantee that some island in the region is going to be hit by a category four or five Hurricane this year, we were fortunate not to have one. Dr. Brewster, I hope, will speak to the, the National Coastal Risk Information Planning Platform and the other measures that we are putting in place to be able to offer some adaptation and some resilience in relation to, to some of these challenges that we are facing. We also felt that we need to have a conversation about health, and health in relation to the ocean, also in relation to people. Because, you know, fish is very healthy, it's a healthy food, but if you look at the ocean, a lot of what is happening in the ocean now is unhealthy. That is why we've chosen to ban plastics. That is why we're having the conversation about restricting the fish that we can catch. And Ms. Leslie is here and she's going to speak to some of those things as well. And then we felt that there was a need to have that whole conversation within a wider context. And um, Ricardo will speak to the, the things we're doing in the blue economy and the partnerships that we're seeking to establish and so on. But if we peel back, Ian, just for a few seconds, 
and think about the context within which we need to have this conversation or why we need to have this conversation. You know, there's an old African proverb that says, until the lion tells the story of the hunt, that the hunter will always get the glory. And until us in the Caribbean start telling our own story, other people are going to get the glory. Until we tell the truth about what has happened to the region, about the trajectory for the region, um, about the things that are important to us in the region, and you know, we're allowing other people to dictate our story. And so there were three things I feel we need to do, and hopefully have that conversation during the course of this conversation. We need to have an understanding as to what is in our maritime space. We need to have some kind of mapping, um, the marine spatial planning. We need to know what's in the water. We need to know what's on the seabed. And then we have to assign a value to it. We're having large conversations now with a number of people in relation to, to being able to use our ocean space or our shared ocean space. But we need to know what's the value of what in, is in that space so that we could actually talk seriously about some of these terms. We have to think differently too about financing in the, in the blue economy. The government cannot do it all. There are some cases where the government will continue to finance some of the things, like we're paying for the repairs of the jetty, but there's some where we're going to have to partner. And I know people sometimes get nervous when we start talking about government partnering with people, but that is the age we live in. Because the amount of work that we need to do, we need to have partners on board to be able to do it um, with Barbados. And then we have to look at the private sector and to find ways to stimulate the private sector to be able to get involved in the blue economy space. And, you know, for the private sector, for the most part, the bottom line really is about profit. And, you know, I think we also now have to stimulate the private sector to be more involved in some kind of impact because at the end of the day, impact investment, because at the end of the day, this is going to affect all of us. And lastly, in this point, in uh, the overseas development assistance, what we've been getting from a lot of our financial institutions in terms of um, aid and assistance, whether it be, be grants or concessionary financing, uh, or the commitments that they make often every year, half the time, you know, the commitments that they make, they don't follow through on. And then uh, the OECD just did a study in September, or released their study in September, that said 2% of all the ODA coming to the world, only 2% is going to the ocean. And all of us in this room know, too, to get that 2% is like pulling teeth. So there is a need for all of that conversation, and I think all of that must be had within the context of regionalism, because you know, if you want to get scope for some of these blue economy projects, you need to have it as a regional platform. If you're going to be able to solve some of the vexing problems that we're facing now, um, with sargasm seaweed, it doesn't only happen to Barbados, it happens across the region. If you're talking about the impact on ocean acidification or rising waters or rising temperatures, it's across the region. So I think we also need a regional approach on it. I, I have the good fortune of having a very experienced and capable staff. And I think they are more than capable during the course of this conversation to speak to a number of the things that we will be doing going forward. Thanks. Minister, you, you mentioned um, the, the financing. What, what about the, the, the recent um, blacklisting? How, how, does, how does that um, add to the challenges um, that we're, we're seeking to mitigate uh, matters as it relates to, to the ministry and its scope of the maritime affairs and blue economy? Well, nobody wants to be blacklisted. I must tell you that I hate the concept of anybody coloring me. You know, you're blacklisted, meaning that I am worse off or less than somebody else, you know. Uh, Barbados has been making a lot of strides over the last two years, certainly, to be able to come into standard with what the international environment expects from us. The reality is, and the tragedy is, that oftentimes when the goalpost is set and we make the adjustments, the goalpost is shifted. So that we find ourselves constantly trying to, to get to a moving target. And it is it's going to be difficult, and there's got to be a point at which we say enough is enough. And, you know, I think a lot of regional leaders is coming to that, to that point as well. But the truth is, you know, the blue economy does not exist in a vacuum. And we don't govern a country in silos, so what happens on one end affects everything that we do. We have to find ways to generate revenue. But if all of your sources of revenue in a COVID environment, blacklisting, <laughs> climate change, I mean, everything, the Prime Minister, in her brilliance, calls it a perfect storm. 
Um, it is a perfect storm. So it is going to be challenging, but it is what it is. And that is why I feel like the other conversations I spoke about earlier, the, the need for looking at new measures for financing, new partners and finding new partnerships in, in, in Africa and other places across the world is going to be important as, as we go for it. And for those of you who just tuned in, just letting you know that we are also streaming on the PMO channel on YouTube. That's the Barbados Prime Minister's office, the YouTube channel. We're also streaming on the BLP TV channel of Facebook, in addition to GIS and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy. Now, the minister just mentioned climate change, and Barbados certainly had uh, an interesting climate in the last four days or so. I, I would like to uh, get the views of uh, our very own Ricardo Ward concerning that and going forward with the ministry and its plans as we move ahead. Morning, Ian and Minister and everyone else. Um, only yesterday evening there was a very interesting um, presentation on CBC as it relates to climate change and water. Um, as we know, climate change can impact every aspect of Barbados' economy. Um, in terms of our blue economy, and when I say blue economy, we relate to all forms of economic and other activities that can occur in the coastal and maritime space. Um, the clearest example we can see in terms of our response is the, the, the scale of activity attended to by the coastal zone management unit. But when you speak about climate change, it's the other dimension. What are we doing? I say this because I want to leave space for coastal zone to respond to the things that they're, they're responsible for. But on the other side of the coin, you can ask the question, what is it that Barbados is doing um, to reduce its contribution to climate change? And that speaks to what is the, the language that is used in international parlance, the mitigation side of things. Um, what are we doing to reduce our, our carbon footprint? We all know that the, the the Prime Minister has expressed a very ambitious goal of trying to become um, fossil fuel free by 2030, um, or at best, uh, at, at least, sorry, carbon neutral. And carbon neutral means uh, reducing the impacts, uh, the contribution that we're making to the atmosphere um, uh, by burning fossil fuels and balancing that with things that have sequestered that, that capture. Um, uh, carbon. In terms of the blue economy, we can see that expressed uh, in terms of some of the work we've done recently at the Oysters Fish Festival and all the activities that are going on across Barbados in terms of the integration of renewable energy. But another dimension might be in the area of the replenishment of fish stocks. It might be in the area of um, um, safeguarding or coral reefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Measures that facilitate. Um, the proliferation of organic life in the sea, because um, once you're organic, it means that you're carbon-based, and, and that is the other side of the equation that I think that we need to attend to as well. Of course, as long as we speak to the adaptation type issues. Yes, doc, good morning, Dr. Brewster. Um, actually, he, when he brought up coral reefs, uh, the first thing I was thinking of is to and, and I would also like to let our viewers know, um, we appreciate your greetings and your comments. You can also send us questions as well. Uh, Dr. Brewster, um, the, what is the difference between the challenges of, of coral reefs, say from the 80s to now? And, and what do you suspect needs to be done in the year 2030 and beyond? Uh, morning to everybody, morning minister. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Ian. I think that, um, as, as Ricky was rightfully pointing out, there are a lot of things that we at Coastal have been doing uh, for a very long time. We have always recognized that climate change for Barbados is real. It is something that is very uh, transcending all sectors and all aspects of environmental consideration. And that's why from the 1990s, we've always tried to integrate climate change uh, adaptation into the activities that we do where we try and design our engineering structures to accommodate for things like increased storminess, sea level rise, uh, the, the, the higher associated activities with swell seasons, especially in the winter, 
when you can get a situation where the, the, swin, the winter swell season, which normally starts in December, can start from as early as October. We try to integrate all of those into our design patterns. From the reef perspective, we've been monitoring reefs since about 1982, when we do significant reef monitoring work every five years, because we found that's the best sort of like time frame to, to actively look at reef monitoring. It is very intensive, it is very time consuming, and therefore we have to factor it in on a specialized uh, monitoring cycle. I think that when you look at the reefs over the years, there's been fluctuations generally, but what we found is that tradition still stands uh, throughout time that the further away you are from large city centers or large clustered areas, the better the reef, the reef quality is. And that has normally been the case. So as you progress away in either direction from Bridgetown, the reef quality normally increases and improves until you get to an area like Whole Town again. And then as you move away from Whole Town, heading further north, the reef, the reef health um, actually improves. One thing that we've seen is that the corals are normally very resilient in terms of their abundance and their diversity remaining consistent. But what has become a little more alarming to us over the last two to three monitoring uh, episodes is the lack of reef fish on the reefs. Okay, and, and that can be attributed to several things. The biggest concern we obviously have is the, the presence of groundwater infiltration onto the reefs causing increasing nutrient loading on the reefs, which means that more, more types of turf algae are growing than the actual filamentous algae, which is a little surprising, but still good for us. But at the same time, the herbivorous grazers, including the black urchins and the, the reef fish themselves that would graze on, on algae are not as present as they used to be. We have to start looking seriously in terms of what we're gonna do to replenish fish stocks on the reef systems themselves. And the priority concern has to be looking at the enhancement and improvement of water quality conditions. Uh, some people may say the issues of lionfish coming in since about 2009, 2010, 2011 have been a concern. And yes, initially they were. But what we have found is that generally, since we started to even do some periodic monitoring of lionfish presence, generally we're finding that the lionfish are not as prolific as they once appeared to be. Now, whether or not that's a good sign, People may say that they're in deeper water. Some people may say that there are only certain locations where you can find large lionfish, which is also a very good thing because it means then that there are isolated locations that can be better managed in terms of culling the lionfish, etc. But one thing is, is uh, evident in terms of doing that is that a lot of people are fishing lionfish, either for their own personal consumption. In some areas, they're providing the lionfish for com commercial um, commercial use because some restaurants do offer lionfish on their menu which is which is very unique to them and that provides an opportunity for keeping that predator species down because lionfish decimate reef fish and other uh, invertebrates on the reef at a very large rate on the island so that, that's where we can go but for right now generally the reefs are somewhat stable we are looking to produce a what we call a reef report card very soon hopefully by december it will be finished and once we get the permission of cabinet once they've reviewed the document then we will start to look to release that a little more publicly but as it stands right now uh the biggest concern that we have on the reefs is the reef fish the reefs themselves are pretty much stable in terms of their coral cover dr brewster what about um rebuilding the coral that 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 focuses in the same um yes yeah. Okay. We, we do if, have, if you could expand on it, please. Okay, as, as, as some of the new initiatives coming out for uh, reef replenishment and reef uh, restoration globally, these started about 10 years ago. Um, there have been different approaches taken in terms of how you can approach reef re rehabilitation generally. The best examples are in places like uh, Moat Labs in, in Florida where they've been using techniques called microfragmentation, which is where you take very small pieces of coral and plate them onto small tiles. And then as they grow quickly, they then are able to be outplanted onto the reef system and grow. Barbados was fortunate as part of the Coastal Risk Assessment and Management Program to establish a, a small coral lab to attempt to try to look at the aspects of fragmentation of corals for outgrowth, both within a lab context and then also 
within the, the, the ocean environment to compare rates of recovery and rates of growth of fragmented corals and then they're out planting onto the reef systems. Obviously, the, the ones that were in the natural environment did much better, but they were more prone to the aspects of things like general environmental impacts, such as bleaching from, from excessive water temperatures, such as what the minister mentioned before, um, as well as the vagaries of wave climate or excessive wave energy and wave, large waves impacting on the structures where they were placed. In the lab, we had a, a slightly different situation whereby while the corals were starting to show signs of growth, the amount of time it was taking them for actually development was a lot longer than anticipated. Now, you must bear in mind is like when you're growing stuff in a lab, it's like for those who keep fish tanks, you have to have a period to seed and allow the aquaria to acclimatize and establish themselves and you bring in your corals and then they also have to recover and, de and develop and start to grow. This is not an instantaneous thing. And then in doing that, when you have that situation established, you would then see proliferation. Because of the time frame of the project itself, we were unable to get to that stage where we were going to be getting to proliferation. But there is strong evidence that it will work. And right now, because of what was going on in terms of the outgrowth of corals, we now have four different types of reef replenishment, restoration uh, permits that have actually been taking place. We have one that is looking at A-frame coral outgrowth where you use fragments of coral, grow them on an on a A-frame underwater, and then as those corals grow, you fragment off those and then transplant them onto reef locations. We also have another one that is about to start shortly in the area of Folkestone, where they're using things called coral trees, which is where you use PVC in extended cross-span cross patterns, and then attach the coral fragments onto strings, and then allow the corals to grow suspended in the water column. And then you do the same thing again. You fragment those and outplant them. We also have a permit that was granted for the use of what they call bio-rock, which is where you actually try to electrolyze a section of coral reef through using solar power onto the reef system and then that actually causes the stimulus of the, of the corals themselves to, to deposit calcium carbonate at a very fast rate. In doing that it actually solidifies around certain types of frame structures that you can build out of large rebar and that then starts to create the structure of a reef with the attached fragments on and then you can start to see within about four years a strong reef building framework starting to occur and once the the electrolysis is ongoing you can get to a stage where after a certain amount of time you disconnect the power and then the reef system will continue to grow. The advantage in that is that it actually creates the opportunities for new habitat to develop in areas where there weren't any before or in areas where the habitat had been so decimated that you actually have to start from scratch. And then finally, right, um, there's the, also the lab. I just wanted to but ask. Like I said, there's yeah, a lot of things. I just, I so just wanted there are a lot of things we're doing, you know. I just wanted to jump back a little bit, but I think I, I suspect it might involve um, um, Chief Fisheries Officer. Um, you mentioned that um, lionfish do not seem to be as proficient um, as they used to be. Has there been an increase in the consumption of lionfish? There used to be. Um, I recall Lion Fish Festivals. I haven't heard about it. Re re well, obviously during this this year, that would have been significantly reduced. But maybe the not the appetite for lion fish. So, um, Ms. Leslie, I I was wondering if you could um, clarify that matter. Has eating lion fish been on the rise? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in terms of lionfish, yes. Um, initially, when the lionfish first reached Barbados, of course, everyone was afraid to even actually uh, fish uh, for the lionfish. And uh, we had to do uh, workshops to introduce the gear to be used, etc. And even, that, even though eventually fishermen were targeting lionfish, a lot of them were giving away the lionfish free. But after the hospitality sector uh, expressed an interest in getting the particular um, species, which is actually a uh, very delicious, a very light flavored uh, fish, very um, succulent, um, then 
locals were gradually uh, introduced to eating the lionfish and uh, they're actually sold now uh, to the public. Um, as you know, Barbados, Barbadians are high consumers of fish, particularly they like the local fresh fish. Uh, consumption is about 36 kilograms per person per year. And the role of the fisheries division is to, to manage and develop the fisheries sector. And of course, for the benefit for the nutritional and food security of Barbados. And therefore, um, we are quite concerned um, not only about invasive species, but also about um, increased pressure on fisheries resources because we need to sustain the fisheries resources of Barbados. So in general though, um, the, the sector um, may be valued ex, ex, ex vessel about 14 to 30 million dollars a year depending on the landings, but value added studies have shown that actually um, the value is much more over $50 million. So that um, it is very important for us to, we take our responsibility very seriously. Uh, in, in the last two years with the, the uh, introduction of the new ministry, we're looking to improve our fisheries policy. We are in the process of actually finalizing that policy with the support of the FAO. And also we are going to be addressing new fisheries management regulations which will help to uh, bring more management, more control of fishing in Barbados and control of the, con the effort uh, in Barbados. For example, we are concerned about the, the gear used in the near shore fisheries and we're looking to, for example, control and uh, limit the use of sand nets. We're looking at introducing uh, size limits for our more larger uh, target species, the dolphin fish, which is our number two keystone species after uh, flying fish. And we recognize that um, there have been a number of changes going on with respect to the fishery of flying fish and dolphin fish as a result of the incursion of sargasm in 2011. So in general, it has been a mixed bag where we have seen the less accessibility of the flying fish uh, to the fishing vessels, but um, even in the summer years, access to dolphin fish, but usually smaller uh, size species. So um, we're looking to introduce a management right to control the, to minimize the capture of small dolphins that are not mature. Uh, in general, uh, we are quite happy in terms of the, the production um, in general, but as I said, in the, the, the sargasm years, the flying fish landings have significantly declined. And one of the reasons uh, we suspect, based on uh, analysis of these landings by uh, the CERMES and support from other universities in South Mississippi, um, we're looking to correlate the sargasm influxes and uh, the impact on the fisheries of dolphin fish and, and flying fish. And basically because of the behavior, the uh, breeding behavior of flying fish where it, it breeds by um, congregating or, or around floating debris, the sargasm is a perfect um, target or home for them to uh, congregate around and, and breed. And as a result of that, um, our normal fish aggregating um, devices of the cane Crash, trash, which we call squealers, uh, are not um, as inviting. And also, um, there has been restriction in terms of access also because of when the sargasm are wrong. The, obviously, the effort of the vessels is significantly reduced because they cannot fish around the sargasm. But um, the Ms. Leslie, I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I just see, see a uh, good morning to Noel out there. Uh, we appreciate your question. Uh, Noel was asking about, um, in regards to not only what you were just saying, but also what about sea eggs um, oh. and the harvesting of those? Uh, actually, um, in terms of sea urchins, sea urchins uh, love brown seaweed, and therefore, um, when the, the sargasm settles, they actually f is a source of food for the sea urchin. And therefore, 
Um, in some years, we have seen the proliferation of the, the, the sea urchin population as in the presence of an availability of sargassum. What has happened in the last uh, year or two, though, is that, of course, there are fluctuations in the population and obviously um, pressure on the population in closed season has also impacted. So we have not been able to open the season this year because of the low numbers of the population. In fact, we've had a moratorium on sea urchins for a number of years in the late 80s and 90s as a result of low population. So we are hoping to be able to build back um, the, the population gradually. Right, okay. And, and we also want to say good morning to Rachel out there. She was wondering if, um, actually, as an adjunct to what you were just saying, if uh, a similar moratorium needs to be placed on reef fish. Uh, actually, in terms of the in terms of reef fish, we need to recognize that we have the near shore reefs and we have the what we call the deep slope or offshore reefs, and uh, certainly we are concerned about adding more protection to the near shore reefs in terms of fishing. In other words, reducing the effort or the fishing effort on the near shore reefs, but certainly the deep slope, um, right now we are not, um, that is still a feasible area for fishing in terms of snappers and groupers, etc. But I want to say that in the context in that we are not looking at a total moratorium, what we're looking at um, a control of the fishing gear, in, uh, restrictions on fishing gear, restrictions on um, locations where you may be able to fish, uh, but this is part and parcel of the plan of the ministry to look at marine management areas and marine protected areas. So more, more or less that will unfold when we look at those areas and we'll get a better understanding of how we will control the effort on the reef fisheries. I have a question though, Joyce, because I was wondering in terms of the whole sargasm aspect, looking at new species of fish that are now being landed as well. And if we're actually trying to keep track of that as well, because you know everyone is now hooked on to amber fish. So, amber fish is a sort of fish that I don't know if it was prolific in the past, but we never used to hear about it until sargassum. But not at least me, at least. Um, well, in terms of again, one of the pluses of sargassum is that we have introduced some new species with associated with the sargassum that could be targeted, and as you said, the amber fish and the jack are species that have been coming into the O waters uh, following the sargasm. So we've had one or two pluses where that is concerned, but we still have to be concerned and um, be cautious about um, fishing these new, um, in these new areas because we have to look also at their uh, size of maturity and make sure that we are not um, doing also damage to, to that. But certainly um, that has been one of the compensating factors uh, in terms of sargassum to, to balance the lack of availability of the friend fish. When I, I believe that, that Ricardo has a, has a question or a comment. No, just a comment. Uh, I, I thought that something that Joyce ma mentioned a while ago um, points to the complexity of the, what we are trying to deal with in terms of the blue economy. For example, um, you would have heard talk about climate change and altering uh, water movement and probably contributing to the landing of um, the beaching of sargassum in Barbados. Um, you heard Joyce mention about the settling and the increased uh, recruitment or the use of it by sea urchins for food. But I wouldn't want persons to just go away and say, well, that's a good thing because um, there's also the complication of smothering of coral reefs. There's also the complication of um, as the sargassum is degrading, um, the removal of oxygen from the water. So it's not just a, a there you go. So it's not just a, a simple someone to just go and say, oh, so, so we should leave the sargassum. Uh, just a flag um, that what we are seeking to attend is not as simple. And, and therefore, uh, there's the need for some patience and tolerance, I guess, and understanding and part of our uh, increased requirement for sensitization that these things require um, deep co consideration and also the, the input and participation by all uh, in Barbados. Thanks. Um, Dr. Brewster, I was just, all right. um, just before we get 
uh, to Dr. Brewster. Let, let, let's hear from some of our other panelists, and we're going to turn now to our maritime attorney, Najla King, and she's going to explain her role within the ministry and things that are coming up in, in her portfolio, so to speak. Greetings, Minister. Greetings, everyone who's viewing. Thank you for tuning in. Good morning again to everyone. Well, my role in the ministry, I work with the shipping department and I facilitate them in making sure that our shipping operations at the domestic and international level are operated in a safe, secure, and efficient manner and that ships perform in a way that does not cause a detriment to the marine environment. The blue economy is all about ensuring that we promote ocean business that can sustain livelihoods for those who depend on the marine environment, but in a way that does not compromise the health of the very marine environment that we would rely on now and in future. In that vein, Barbados since 1970 has been an, mem an IMO member state. IMO stands for the International Maritime Organization, which is the international regulatory body for shipping. And Barbados is party to various IMO instruments on maritime safety, maritime security, and marine pollution prevention. And stemming from those conventions, the ministry has, between last year until present, prepared a significant amount of legislation, which is currently in process, so that we can be compliant in all of those areas that I just mentioned. We have made a significant step in separating domestic from international shipping. We have two separate registers, one for domestic vessels and one for international vessels. The importance of the legal separation was so as not to impose onerous requirements on smaller vessels that realistically cannot comply with the inordinate amount of requirements contained in IMO conventions. And we created regulations taking into account the size of smaller vessels, their area of operation, and their day-to-day their day -to -day activities. So for instance, we have small vessels that commercially operate, meaning operate for a profit, and those who operate just for pleasure. But to ensure that these vessels are always operating in a way that they do not cause safe, a, a danger to those operating at sea, we are requiring that going forward, pledge of vessels registered in Barbados would need a pledge of vessel operator certificate of competency, and the commercial ones would be operating under a Barbados small vessel license. For our larger vessels, these have to be. Well, for that, real quick, Nigel, what does I don't want you to say these things and just gloss over them. You just said something that is so important, but you didn't explain it. You have to tell the people. What is the value in what it is you're proposing to do or what the legislation will do? It's already been sent to the CPC for drafting, so it's going to become the law. But you have to explain it so that people understand what it is they're seeking to do and where. Essentially, what we are seeking to do with the international and domestic legislation is to transform the entire shipping industry of Barbados, to make it more sustainable, promote economic growth and prosperity train people to operate in various capacities in ocean base, i.e. wet maritime jobs actually going to sea, and dry jobs based on shore, example working in ports, working in educational institutions, training persons how to operate in these environments. The domestic vessels legislation has various provisions which would promote this. For instance, we made provision for those persons who have lots of years of experience on the water to train others who would now be coming up in seamanship navigation and other marine operations. There is also provision for foreign registered vessels who like to visit Barbados, but after six months they have to leave, which is a incon an inconvenience, is also an expense. We are introducing a cruising permit system to allow them to stay here for a year 
on that cruising permit and when it expires, they just renew again. Also for pledge of vessels who do not operate for profit, we have also extended that if they want to put their vessels to temporary commercial gain, we are offering temporary permits for them to operate and also make a profit. We are also allowing night water taxi services by sea, providing that they have navigational lights and adhere to general safety navigation rules. And there are a whole set of other things that we're introducing generally to support the industry and to continue to maintain a viable maritime sector for Barbadians now and in the future. Thank you, Najla. Now, um, when you're speaking about these licenses and everything, I think that brings us um, very succinctly to our next panelist, the Chief Technical Officer, Jacqueline Blackman. I, I believe that um, there's a card process and, and so on. If you could outline it for the benefit of, of our viewers. Thank you. Good morning, Minister Ian, colleagues. Good morning, everyone. Um, the license um, process is part of the registration process that the small vessels, which are registered locally, go through with the Ministry of Maritime Affairs. Um, there, we have instituted a new licensing system, basically the plastic licensing system, so that um, those licenses are more hardy and are able to, to survive on the water. Previously, we would have issued those licenses in, as card. That is just part of the process of what we're trying to do. As Najla said, we're trying to facilitate the operation of both international and domestic shipping, um, both for the operators and the users, and ensure that that is done in a safe and secure manner and on um, clean oceans, as the IMO would say, which means that we are also working with other agencies to, um, as much as possible, prevent any kinds of pollution. So therefore, the, the, the movement towards the plastic license, although it seems basically like a simple thing, is, is part of that process in terms of the ease of operation. And, uh, and speaking of that, we can also draw reference to the facilitation of vessels at our ports, where we have engaged in um, become party to and are trying to draft um, a facilitation bill, which actually provides for the ease of vessels when they arrive at the port um, to be able to conduct their business while they arrive, while they stay and depart. Um, because most of these vessels, when they do come, have to fill up various forms from various agencies, such as immigration, um, customs, and the port as well. And um, the IMO has, in its facilitation convention, um, requested that we do uh, an electronic single window where um, all those forms are done electronically. And that can reduce some of the burden because most of these forms are similar from each agency. And we're working on that. So the licensing that we're doing for the domestic, for the, the domestic vessels um, as Ian had mentioned, and this, um, the example of the single window, maritime single window, is an example of how we are hoping to facilitate the operation of shipping while we're doing it and developing it in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Okay, I was just looking at uh, some of the, the comments that are coming in. Uh, don't forget, we are on Facebook on not only our very own page, which is listed as the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and at the Blue Economy. We're also on the Facebook page of uh, the Barbados Government Information Service, as well as that of BLP TV on their Facebook page as well. Uh, there's a question here, and I'm not sure which panelists should be answering it, but it's talking about, is there... Uh, a threat of sargassum smothering coral reefs? Serious. I think that question arose because of the point you made initially, and the, the person is probably inquiring as to is there, what's the validity in this statement? If, um, dealing with that, it's, it's something that it, it can become pretty apparent. The, the, the problem is, is that when you, when you look at sargassum, Sargasm is really and truly only impacting directly. 
the east coast, the southeast coast, and the south coast of the island. Very rarely do you see sargasm like on the west coast. You see sargasm on the north coast as well, right? And so sometimes people may say that you're not really seeing an impact on the reefs, but to be honest, if you are out by the Crane, Ginger Bay, Sam Lords, coming right the way down Foul Bay, coming all the way down, when sargasm is coming on shore, it piles up to more than five feet thick. And when it's out to sea, as it starts to deteriorate, it can amass on a reef up to 18 inches to two feet. And then that sits there and it starts to break down and you'll see this water start turning brown. And as it starts to deteriorate, you know, it, it hangs around, the water goes out a little purplish color. All that is when oxygen is starting to be sucked out of the system. So you're having a situation whereby the, the, the deoxygenation of the water will lead to significant stress and problems being faced on the reef. Some, some things that you know, people also don't really truly really recognize is that when large um, sargasm mats are coming on shore, they come in impulses. So you could have sargasm sitting on a coast for two days and then overnight it vanishes. You get a break for, for, for two or three days and then all of a sudden another set of sargasm is here. So the, the continual influx of sargasm does pose a significant problems to reefs. I remember, I think it was back in 2017, uh, we had a situation whereby we started to see actually fish washed up in sargasm and there was a baby dolphin somewhere up long, I think it was Long Beach or one of the other locations. Turtles also get entangled in sargasm, so it kills a lot of marine fauna um, in, in terms of it's just pure entanglement of them. And because of the thickness of the sargasm itself, it means that those that have to breathe air, uh, species like dolphins, baby dolphins especially, and more importantly, turtles, cannot actually get to the surface to breathe and therefore they drown. So yes, sargasm does pose a major problem, especially to near shore reefs um, along the south, southeast, east coast, and north, northern coast of Barbados. I know it's early days yet, but we, we just, for the last four days, had a huge amount of rainfall. Um, I was wondering how um, the the rainfall would have contributed to erosion on any of our coastlines or if CZMU is about to make an assessment or something like that? Given the, the type of rainfall that we've had over the last week or so, we actually have to seriously look to go out now and look at the, the potential runoff erosion impact that has affected a lot of the beaches. Now, the problem that we face is that we are actually supposed to be in a recovery phase leading into the winter swell season. Because normally after September, October, things are supposed to quiet down in terms of wave activity once, once the major storm months are passed. And then you would get a break of about two months and then starting in December, the winter swell season would start. For those of you that have been actively going to the sea over the last couple of days, despite the rain, um, you would have also noted that we had some swell waves this, this uh, weekend gone. Uh, two and a half to three meter waves were actually impacting some areas of the coastline. And that therefore means, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, that this, that's just a, an anomaly, an outlier, and that the winter swell season has not started yet. But we must also pay attention to what's going on in the North Atlantic in terms of waves. Runoff is going to be a big problem because it brings a lot of sediment with it through the watercourses, through the gullies, through the drains out into the sea, right? And because of the torrential rains that we have had, we've had extensive and excessive runoff into the near shore. So I think that we can expect that there's been a lot of temporary beach erosion in terms of blowout from those same watercourses and drains. And what we have to do now is actually try and get our guys out to, to just do a quick run around of the west and south coast to determine um, how much blow erosion has occurred or if it if it is within our normal accepted envelope for erosion uh, what you must accept also is that um, with that blow that means there's a pulse that has been injected into the near shore coastal environment carrying all of the debris waste uh, a pollution pulse and i think it is uh, things such as that that the the National Reefs to Reef Roofs to Reef Program 
trying to address, trying to minimize um, the load, the pollution loading associated with those types of pulses um, through things like watershed management upstream uh, and things such as uh, the, the, the control of, of discharges from residences and from different um, sectors that operate on the land. So there's the impact obviously on reefs, which is our, our main barrier from uh, climate change and as they disappear, then the erosion, um, more massive erosion events can occur. Uh, you will recall that the minister made reference as one of the pillars um, that he's interested in is on physical development. So if we lose our, our reefs and if or reduce the resilience of our reefs um, and the slow and onset effects of climate change, uh, the reef damage, the um, increased water temperatures, um, the coral reef deaths and so on and so forth, the uh, sea level rise and so on, where those will bring increasing episodes of, of coastal erosion and also um, the increased demand for resources to fix and, and, and adapt to the challenge that would, we would ultimately face down the road. Okay, we, we got a question here uh, from Rachel about the Graham Hall Sluice Gate. Um, I'm not sure if that falls under CZMU. Um, they wanted to find out what is, if it is, what, what is the latest regarding that? Uh, no, the Sluice Gate doesn't fall under CZMU. It falls under the Ministry of Environment. When we were in the Ministry of Environment, we were pretty much involved in that. But as, um, as it stands right now, the sluice gate itself is still used as a flood control, flood alleviation device for the Graham Hall swamp area, as well as the areas of Amity Lodge and Harmony Hall in and around the, the, the actual swamp itself. I think the, the issue that people um, have to understand is that because the Graham Hall area is a large catchment basin for as far inland as uh, Adams Castle, Sheraton, Newton, and coming down in some areas. Um, it all flows in there through underground flow and overground flow, obviously. So after we've had such heavy rainfall over the last week or so, there's an essential requirement that the gate has to be open now to allow those water levels to be lowered, especially in the swamp area. Otherwise, those people that do live in Amity Lodge Harmony Hall and um, surrounding districts will be prone to flooding. Those people that are also within the area, the direct area of St. Lawrence Swamp, Graham Hall Swamp, will also be seeing elevated water levels uh, in some places as far as close as in their backyard. So maybe even um, St. Lawrence Primary School, I think, sometimes suffers with elevated water levels as associated with rising water levels within the eastern section of the swamp. And therefore, there's a need to open the gate periodically to deal with excessive water flow out into the sea. I think that's probably what drainage unit will have to be looking at doing uh, very soon uh, to ensure that that water can run off and, and reduce the levels in the swamp. Th thank okay. you. Let me um, also I'm add in, let me also add quickly because I don't want Barbadians to get the impression that that sluice gate is not being properly managed. It's just that as part of its management, the way we operate it at various times may shift. So the, the whole idea of the Green Hall Swamp is actually discussed almost weekly at Cabinet. And, and the management of the South Coast entirely, that whole project is still very fresh in our mind. So there are times when you have to open the Suske, as, as Leo said, and there are times when you don't. But it is, it is always being managed. And the Environmental Protection Department is still on the job, still monitoring the water quality there. Um, we're still actively looking at new ideas as it relates to the, to the Graham Hall Swamp. In fact, there are a number of proposals now that, that we could work together on going forward to make sure that it's not only environmentally friendly, but that it is aesthetically pleasing, it is a social site, so, so, so that the management of the entire space and the, the sluice gate, gate as a consequence is still being actively considered. So. If the public sees it open, sometimes they may panic, but it is part of the management of the, the, the area. I believe that Na Najla had a, a comment or observation. 
I just wanted to follow on from the last thing my colleague Jackie said when she spoke about the facilitation of international maritime traffic legislation, which is also in progress for the ministry, well, almost to finalization. That piece of legislation not only makes it less cumbersome for vessels coming here in terms of the documents they submit and the mode in which they submit, but to link to the earlier conversations about climate change, the less time that vessels spend at birth during clearance processes, the less emissions are generated and they also save on fuel. Other climate change initiatives also going on in the maritime transport sector in regards to shipping is the implementation of MARPOL and its SITS, which deals with prevention of pollution of the atmosphere by ships and to ensure that overall ships operate energy efficiently. So what we have done is that we have prepared legislation to ensure that vessels operating in overseas territories flying our flag will be surveyed and certified to be MARPOL and it's its compliant. What this means is that at their design stage for new vessels and the operational stage for existing vessels, there are surveys and checks to ensure that the ship has a ship energy efficiency management plan, which would define and clarify exactly how from voyage conception to voyage conclusion, energy efficiency operations on board will be handled. And to ensure that the general condition of the vessel, her equipment, her fittings, arrangements, everything comply with the actual information in the certificates, which would be the International Air Pollution Prevention Certificate, which will be issued by the Ministry, and the International Energy Efficiency Certificate. This will be facilitated through flag state inspectors who would be designated by the ministry to go into foreign ports to check that vessels flying our flag are compliant with our national maritime legislation, not only in relation to MARPOL and its sits, but in relation to all of the other instruments that we are party to. Move off of shipping um, because to me, shipping and maritime presents the biggest opportunity for the blue economy, and that's, that's the truth. In terms of the economic returns, shipping will be, will be it. That maritime space is going to be it. The advantage that we have is that we started so far behind in a way that we now have, uh, I mean, almost a blank sheet within which to define this space. And there are going to be a number of new and interesting jobs in that maritime space. We were discussing, Nigel and I, the ministry, the move to mo toward autonomous ships and the new skills that you're going to need to have to be able to operate those ships. And that Barbados, essentially, while these ships may not have people manning them, you're going to need hubs in different places. And that Barbados could essentially become a hub if we get ahead of the game, put the legislation in place, f and the leader in the region, or maybe in the world, for, for autonomous shipping. And what we're also doing in the port is to make recognizing the direction in which shipping is going. The port has now set as, as its own vision the need for them to become a green port and to be able to use renewable energy to service some of these, some of these ships. But also we're now about to build out the space to have a much larger haul-out facility to be able to, to deal with a number of the vessels that currently pass Barbados Bay. So there's a whole set of business now to be generated by having a proper shipyard to allow us to service the ships when they come here, clean, clean the ships when they come here, we also have to make sure that our legislation, and we're working on it, I know, now has what is necessary for the ST, STCW training so that Barbadians can get the competencies and the skills and be certified here to increase the number of Barbadians that are actually working on the ships. During COVID, and, and I met a guy who, a Barbadian guy, a young Barbadian male, who was trapped on a ship somewhere across the world. And the story he recited to me is that while other countries were not allowing their nationals to come home, that he felt so proud of Barbados because Barbados was allowing their nationals to come home. We kept our borders open, we allowed Barbadians to come home. And that people from different countries all over the world were so envious of the position that Barbados took and were very envious, to be truthful, of the Prime Minister. And the leadership that she showed at a very difficult time, I think, most people like to believe that if they're presented with a challenge in life that they're going to take the high road. But I think day by day we get these little challenges and most of us don't take the high road. You know, and, and, and we assume that when these big movie moments come, 
that we're going to take the high road. And the government of Barbados took what, in my mind, is a very high road at a very difficult time. And if ever there's been leadership in shipping, and I, I want it to be seen in that context, is the leadership the Prime Minister showed at a time when people were very concerned for their own well-being. You know, the Prime Minister saying, no, this is who we are. And this is how we're going to lead. So I think there is a, a, a position to be said, for, uh, the point that we took during COVID, the leadership we showed, of course, we eventually won an award for it, but that was never the intention. It was to, to lead with, with a kind of moral authority and that shipping because of that, because we recognize how important shipping is. The second thing is I think during COVID is that we recognize fishing was important. And while many other sectors were not allowed to trade, fishermen were still able to fish. Fishermen were given permission to fish from morning to night like normal. We kept the fish markets open. So it was a commitment in many ways to the blue economy space. And if, if COVID hasn't shown us that the blue economy space is important, then nothing will. You know, most of the goods coming to Barbados, about 80%, 85%, still come through the port, still come through the Bridgetown port by, by ships. So that is important. I think what persons are concerned about, a lot of people in Barbados are asking me about Kirk, are you ever going to have the water taxi service? And maybe Dr. Bruce, you could speak to some of the challenges we had associated with that, but it's something that I'm actively looking at to allow people to move from the north to the south. People are asking me, are we going to have a regional ferry service? And then there are also challenges associated with that, with Barbados' position and whether it's going to be economically viable. And again, it goes back to the original point I made about private sector interests and being able to stimulate, stimulate the private sector to do what essentially will be a, a private sector in, investment. So there are, there are a number of things in that regard. I've also seen people asking, Ms. Leslie, about the licenses uh, for people who come into our waters to fish. Do we issue licenses? Are we going to offer licenses to somebody, the international ships? And of course, what methods do we now have in place or plan to have in place to deal with IUU fishing? And I think you need to address our concern with illegal, unregulated, and, and unreported fishing um, as, as you go forward. And what does that mean for Barbados as we attempt to reposition ourselves? Because there's serious blue economy issues. And, and there are serious blue economy issues that have to be addressed by a serious government. The other thing is when we go to some of these international meetings, and we all attend international meetings, there are conversations being had that if Barbados does not find itself at the table, people make decisions for you. And so when we decided that telling our, our story had to be the theme is because we recognize, we recognize that. You know, there are people now having conversations in relation to what is inside the, the shared space. You know, when we were in Norway, we, we had a whole conversation about Barbados' need to fight for that space and to ensure that if there are benefits to be derived from that space, we get it too. So people see these things on television. You know, when people go diving for minerals, they, have, they spend a lot of time doing it. They spend a lot of money doing it. It takes years. So you have to gather a number of samples, thousands. Of the thousands you gather, maybe one may prove viable. Then it proves viable. You spend 20 years trying to convert it into something. Small island states do not have that luxury. They don't have those resources. So you have to be at the table to say, okay, but when you do find in our shared space or my water, these are the benefits that I want. And, and so it is that whole conversation on the international scene. There's a conversation on the regional scene. There's a conversation on the, on the local scene that has to be had about what we're doing in the, in the blue economy space, whether it is in shipping, whether it is any wonderful work that exists in coastal, that has been done at Coastal Zone. I met a a guy who was speaking, we were actually having a conversation about the islands and if we're going to build, if Barbados is going to do the islands or not, and he was referring to the amount of data and scientific data to make real decisions that, is, that lies in coast. So somebody asked me again the other day about the Narab, the, the Narab, what do you pronounce? The Narabima, Narabima, the Narabima, the ship, Nabarima. The ship in the, the waters, and they were asking me, what is Barbados going to do in relation to that? And then there was this whole conversation, and you know, people were saying things. We have to be guided by science. We have to be guided by facts. And that's been my response from the start. We have to be guided by the science. We have to be guided by the facts. And people say all kinds of things, and they want to call you out to respond to those things. But you know, this is, the blue economy is a serious space. 
making serious decisions. And, and so I just want it to be seen within that context. But I feel, Joyce, there are a number of things as it relates to IUU fishing that we have to discuss and what we're going to do about that. I think the point that we made about catching small fish, to me that is, I am not going into next year with that still happening, period. So that has to be addressed. Um, the, the part fishing, I know that there is a debate about that. I feel that we have to stop it, even if it is for a, a while. And it is something that we have to do going forward. It's, for me, it's as simple as that. Uh, I think also very quickly that, you know, Dr. Brewster, the, the amount of work that you were doing t along the coastlines to keep Barbadians safe, I feel we need to talk about those things too. And then the intellectual conversation that we're having to figure out the blue economy, um, Ricardo, you know, those are some of the things that I wish we would get the opportunity to discuss this morning. I don't know if we can have time to cover all of them, but I think we've got to come back. Because the reality for me is, is that there's a lot of work that's clearly going on in the ministry that it's a good opportunity for us now because we started to tell the story that we've got to keep telling the story, right? Um, I really and truly got a laud Najla for the work that, that she and Jackie have been doing in terms of um, shipping because shipping is like one of those silent dark nights that you, you just keep plugging away, plugging away, plugging away, plugging away, plugging away, and slowly things will start to turn and, and be effective. But when, when the impact is seen and felt through implementation, that is when the change is going to be noticed, you know. And I think that's been one of the voids in maritime that's been in existence for a long time that we now have to actually try and, and develop and push. And that is where, as, as the minister rightfully said, new opportunities are going to arise. From our end, well, coastal is coastal. We always working. We always keep things on track. And we, we try to do what we do as best we can, given, given the type of people which are hardworking, enduring people. The staff is enduring. The staff is enduring. Um, I, I must say, as the minister rightfully pointed out, we've done a lot of work through our recent coastal risk assessment and management program. And in doing that, we, we developed the National Coastal Risk Information Planning Platform, which in itself is a, a unique system that's supposed to look at risk on and its potential impacts from coastal hazards on the coastline. We, we looked at eight um, hazards, hazards or potential hazards that can impact not only the coast but the island in general. And then we actually try to map some of those impacts, not only for the coastline, but as I said, for the island, because it's a national planning platform. And a lot of the information generated there um, is, is like 2015, 2016 data, and we now have to bring it current to 2020. And we're trying to liaise with the relevant agencies to do that. So we're working very closely now with Lands and Surveys Department. But as it stands right now, there's a lot of stuff that, that we are doing through work with the Department of Emergency Management that is going to be significantly beneficial for them when the platform um, becomes interagency operable, right? But we use the platform within Coastal as part of our town planning assessment process now, which gives us a lot more credibility and decision-making uh, fluidity in being able to look at things that speak to clifftop setbacks, coastal setbacks, issues of storm surge, and what sort of new development strategies have to be implemented along the coastline. And as part and parcel of that, because we're also working on the updating of the integrated coastal zone management plan, we will be coming to the public very soon with a coastal zone uh, management plan consultation uh, that has to really and truly speak to how the new plan is going to integrate all the risk and climate change information that we've garnished over the last seven years to then lead the way in terms of what next we will be looking at as coastal. So I think you know it's, it's, it's an essential program, but the, the ability now to look at things like economic risk doesn't only lie with coastal, but it lies with other agencies and government. And economic risk, especially especially along the coastline and the type of infrastructure and the value of the infrastructure and the cost of the land that is found in Barbados. And people are always amazed at what value people place on the coastline in terms of when you look to buy land on the coast. Um, people don't appreciate really and truly the true value and worth of that. And because of the type of infrastructure that's there, the risk that it faces when we have the potential for 
As the minister said yesterday, category four, five, six hurricane storms now coming across the region. And remember that this is the most intense season that we've had since, what was it, 2015? Or something like that, um, in terms of named storms. These things are unprecedented. I, I think that, you know, we have to come to grips with these things now. Um, All right, Ricardo, and then and then Najla, and then and then me bef just before Joyce. Yeah, I think one of the uh, main challenges for us um, in terms of rolling out the blue economy is trying to avoid a lot of the failings that we would have experienced on land. Mm -hmm. We have all of these years of experience, and we know what these things are. Mm -hmm. uh, and having said that, that does not to say it's unique to Barbados. It is a small island developing state condition where um, we, we don't have the full flexibility that we would like, even though a lot of the things that we face are far more pressing than more developed countries. We don't have the finances. We, we provide um, um, substantial uh, support to our citizens in terms of the social safety net, etc., And therefore, the flexibility in terms of being able to do all the things that we would like to do is not there. Um, but I say that to, to go on to, to reference two things that the minister made reference to. That is knowledge of our maritime um, natu natural resource endowment. Um, this is a new frontier for us. And also uh, the reference to data and information management, collection, storage management, and I go beyond that to say democratization. Um, because as, as I was pointing out before, uh, even as we face an environmental, social, or an economic challenge, the response to it, to it by us, by the very nature of being a small island developing state, is even more pressing. Um, the access to data, the collection of data, the access to information and so on is something that we've, we, we are woefully um, uh, behind on. Um, we recently conducted a study, a scoping study, with the support of the United Nations Development Program that did a broad scan of um, coastal and maritime activity, blue economy activities in, in Barbados and would have recommended a series of, um, of uh, recommendations for us to consider. I wouldn't go into those here, uh, but it is something that would inform the definition of our work going forward. Uh, but one of the things that they pointed out, uh, one of the key things that they pointed out that I, uh, is near and dear to me is for us to be able to collect information for ourselves and by ourselves better. And not only that, to try and seek to access um, from international sources all of the data and information that would have been generated on the basis of approvals that we would have provided in years gone by to research vessels and so on passing through our waters um, to, to build up that knowledge base of our natural resource endowment. Um, we are currently building on the Blue Economy Scoping Study uh, with a, 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 a program with the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, it is assisting us with building out a Blue Economy Roadmap. Um, that is going to be a finer grain. It's going to address issues of policy is going to address issues of capacity building and um, perhaps even more importantly um, stakeholder sensitization and involvement of the wider Barbadian community in terms of um, not just coastal and marine uh, management, coastal and marine stewardship, but stewardship of our economy, stewardship of, of our environment and our, how we interrelate with one another and the environment as a whole. Um, and following on from that, we actually have a, a stakeholder blue economy stakeholder sensitization workshop, um, which will be far more elaborate than what we're doing here this morning, scheduled for November 9th. Uh, and you have to register for it, so you can find the, the requisite information on um, the ministry's uh, web page. In addition to that, we are doing some work with the Nature Conservancy, and one of the key things that we're trying to uh, build out under that uh, work uh, is something the minister also referenced in, he, in the beginning, uh, preparation of a marine spatial plan, um, not just for the coastal zone, but also for the entirety of Barbados's uh, maritime space. 
such that we avoid um, user conflicts, such that we know fully what resources are exploitable, um, and, and not just what are exploitable, but how we go about exploiting them um, in the safest way possible, and to generate the, the kind of utility that we will want um, as we seek to pursue our, our sustainable development goals. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ricardo. And for those of you who are interested in registering for the symposium that's coming up on the 9th of this month, uh, the site is barbadosblueeconomy.org. And now I'm going to turn to Najla, who, um, Na Najla, then, Najla then Joyce, in terms of contributions. Firstly, in response to a viewer's query about further explanation to the licenses, when I made reference to the licenses, I was speaking to the coming shipping domestic vessels legislation, where we develop a new framework for how Barbados registered com commercial vessels will be governed and Barbados registered small vessels will be governed, as well as foreign visiting small craft who temporarily come here. So the Barbados Small Vessel License is the new license that will be required for vessels registered on the Barbados Domestic Register that only operate in Barbados. And what that means for you to use your vessel to make a commercial profit for you, you need to have that license. We are moving away from the speedboat license. This is based on feedback from the industry of the confusion they have had over the years, people asking what is a speedboat. So the collective term going forward is a domestic vessel, meaning a vessel that grosses 150 gross tons or below. For pledge of vessels, which operate for leisure, they would need a pledge of vessel operator certificate of competency, which is a documentation to say that you are competent to safely operate in the marine space. It is not a license because you are not commercially operating, hence for the Barbados small vessel license would not be required for pledge of vessels. Additionally, to add to the minister's earlier statement about the ministry and its activities being guided by science. Shipping is one of those fields that is very scientifically and technologically based. And the rate of advancements and developments in shipping is based on new developments that operate in nautical technical fields and the IMO technical experts, they keep us abreast of these developments and we in turn at the local level have to ensure is reflected in our legislation. So one of the additional things that the ministry is adding is a system for marine notices to ensure that we keep pace with these IMO legislative developments which happen at such a rapid rate. So that for example, when we put technical requirements into shipping regulations, and it's subsequently thereafter there is another addition or another amendment, we can simply publish it to mariners in a marine notice. And because it would relate to those regulations and it is pursuant to the act, it has to be complied with. So this is another mechanism to ensure that we publicize mandatory technical information to the shipping industry in a timely and effective manner. And this will be coming under our new Merchant Shipping Act. Thank you very much, Najla. Uh, I do believe that our Chief Fisheries Officer also had an observation. Yes, thank you, Ian. Um, I am tasked to speak to the whole issue of the importance of the internationally, um, the concept of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, now, this is a serious issue internationally simply because um, of its impact on the fisheries resources and the depletion of the fisheries resources. Um, if I can break it down, um, when we consider illegal fishing at the national level, it would be mean, or international level, it would mean your vessels that fly your flag are fishing without the authority to do so um, under your own national legislation, so they do not have a fishing license or are not 
authorize to fish. And therefore, if you do that, then you'll be conducting illegal fishing. For example, also, um, when we close the CX season and, and you fish for CX, that is an example of illegal fishing. So I just wanted to use those as an example of the fact that um, when we consider um, are you fishing, we need to consider the, the different components. Now, unreported, that component of unreported fishing means that for example, you are authorized to fish, but you are not reporting on your catches accurately or you're not reporting at all. Now, at national level, we'll be bringing regulations which will make it compulsory for you to declare your catches uh, when you land. So that will be taken at, at, the, at the management and regulatory level. Uh, when we consider you now um, unreported fishing, sorry, uh, yes, unregulated fish is the third component of it. And when we look at the unregulated fishing, um, for example, um, you're globally, there are within the, in our region, the Western Central Atlantic Fisheries Commission is the regulatory, sorry, the, the regional fisheries body that oversees the advice in terms of fisheries in our region. We also have a regulatory body, which is the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, which regulates, assigns and regulates um, matters of fisheries as it relates to tunas and tuna-like species. So for example, um, if in that regulatory context, um, Barbados would have, uh, and other countries in the region that fish in the eventual Central Atlantic or in the Atlantic in general, uh, would be allocated quotas for different species um, of, of fish. For example, there are quotas for, for Barbados, uh, Big Eye Tuna, there be quotas or uh, limits for yellowfin, etc. So when you, in this regulatory environment, if you fish above or more than the quota assigned to that particular species, then you are breaking the rules. So this is what is called unregulated fishing. What also happens is that um, if we look at our maritime space, we know that our exclusive economic, economic zone is delimited, and we also uh, have position for extended continental shelf. So all of that is, will be considered our exclusive economic zone. And our vessels, our national registered vessels, legally fish within that zone. Now, if you go into someone else's waters, an uh, exclusive economic zone of another country, that would be illegal fishing. Um, then there's the area that is called the common, the, which is remaining now, which is considered the high seas, where after persons or entities or states have declared their exclusive economic zones, there's a region beyond that that is considered the high seas, which is fishing that is allowed for all states. Now, even in that context, if you are fishing for species that are controlled by ICAT, uh, even if your vessels are fishing on the high seas, they still have to fish and they're carrying your flag. They still have, we still have a limit in which we can capture um, a, a quantity of fish that we can capture. But there are vessels that are operating out there on the high seas who are fishing indiscriminately, they're not taking into account the, the regulatory ma or management measures for the particular species, they're using illegal gear, all sorts of things, and they're not reporting, and, they, and, they have, and they're also probably exceeding um, or even not exceeding their particular quota. So that is the whole complexity of IUU fishing. So in terms of Barbados's context, um, the, we are not only party to ICAT, but there is a common, um, the Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy, which it's, gives guidance in terms of fisheries management uh, for members of, I, um, of the CARICOM states. And in that policy, we take very seriously the issue of IUU fishing. We are also under the WCAFSI FAO Commission um, we have developed an international plan of action um, to control 
illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and to mitigate against it. And we now, at the national level, have to develop our own national policy in order to address it. But I've mentioned one or two areas in which we are currently addressing and will continue to address and manage our vessels such that they do not um, conduct IUU fishing. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very um, initial, a complex look at, an, uh, at a very complex yes. issue. Yeah. I really do appreciate that. Now, now fishing requires people. Uh, people are employed. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because what we're also doing as part of Bluefest 2020 week of activities is a series called Men of Honor telling our stories. These are looking at old time seafarers, whether super tankers, schooners, or other vessels where they, they cut their teeth and they were looking at how they missed things like the National Union of, of Seamen and other things like that. It's going to be showing both on CBC TV 8 and it will also be featured uh, once a day uh, at least on uh, Instagram. And uh, once again, our handle for Instagram is MMABE underscore BB. That's Men of Honor telling our story. I, I have a, a chance to interview a, lo a lot of guys and you'd be surprised there's a guy, one guy who is 79 years old and he moves better than I do. Um, <laughs> so it's a lot of fun and be sure to look out for it, as I said, whether on Instagram or TV8. Uh, at this point, I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity to thank everybody today, Dr. Leo Brewster, the director of the Coastal Zone Management Unit, uh, Ricardo Ward, our climate change coordinator, and uh, Jacqueline Blackman, the Chief Technical Officer, Najla King, our Maritime Attorney, and uh, Joyce Leslie, our Chief Fisheries Officer. And uh, I saved the best for last, our representative of St. Michael South and the Minister of Maritime Affairs in the Blue Economy, Kirk Humphrey. And in fact, um, as I'm giving the vote of thanks, uh, Minister, I would, I would like to ask you um, to give, as a summation, the, the way you see the blue economy in going forward. All right. Thank you, Ian, and of course, thanks to all the staff. An hour and a half goes by so fast because there's so many things that I had hoped we'd had the opportunity to discuss. Perhaps next time we need to have a smaller conversation, maybe about one or two topics, and just really beat them out. Um, but again, thanks to all the staff. Um, for those who are watching, you can see the competency within the ministry, the depth within the ministry as well. Um, if I come around the table, the things that struck me as the chief fisheries officer was wrapping up and spoke to the IU fishing and the work that we're going to be doing in that regard, I'm very happy to see some of the work. But again, some of the conversations we've had at these international meetings relate to the subsidies that are being offered to some of these vessels on the international stage that allows that subsidize these bigger vessels from these larger countries to do damaging work in our waters. And I remember at one of the meetings I had attended, when they were looking at subsidies, we literally had to be making an argument to protect our own little subsidies. We were offering a couple hundred dollars to repair boats and, and to define subsidies so as not to be able to, to hurt um, Caribbean countries and small island developing states. You know, and the, the ironic thing is that a lot of these cases, a lot of these developed countries have already gone that road. They've helped their industry up, and, and now they're saying to other people, you know, you, know you, can, you can't help your industry up. And so those are the things we have to fight. But at the same time, we also have to fight the idea that people are subsidized to engage in IUU fishing in our waters. I also feel the tuna project that we just started with the FAO, which we will sign next week, which is, a, is about $5 million that would allow us to develop the tuna industry, is also going to be very important. I spoke about partnerships because we won't be able to do all these things on our own. And with the support of the FAO, what we're going to do is that we're going to be taking the same tuna, so we're not cashing more, but we're going to be getting more value from the fish. And that is what I think we need to do. How do we add value without depleting our resources and continuing to be, to be sustainable as we go forward as well? With the work we're doing in shipping with Jackie and with Najla, it's clear. I think by the end of next year, we would have had gone through the whole gamut and have the most sophisticated legislation in the Caribbean as it relates to shipping and to present ourselves to the world as a serious shipping destination. 
and then use our ship registry consequently as a source of significant revenue for Barbados as we go forward. And very soon we're going to be issuing an RFP to work with someone, to, to partner with someone as we develop the ship registry for Barbados. And what we're doing with the UNDP and Compi Caribbean in terms of the roadmap and the blue scoping study for Barbados is important because it doesn't make sense to talk about a blue economy you don't have a plan. And so to be able to plan and, and as we go forward is going to be vital and we're doing a lot of work on that end as well. So we're doing the practical things. There are also some thinking that we have, some thinking we have to do about the, the space. And Dr. Brewster spoke about some of the things we're doing both in terms of adaptation and mitigation um, on, on the one hand as we build out our coral reefs, as we attempt to, to have with the support of the IDB to become more resilient along, along the coast. But just the science behind everything we've done, you know, uh, the science that we would have had, we were about to produce the islands, one on the east coast and one on the west coast. Um, but of course, COVID now has meant that those plans have to be on the back page, you know, the back burner. But we've done a lot of work which we can share with Barbados. So overall, there are a number of things happening in the ministry. I think the, the government has been praised for a blue economy because it was, the Prime Minister had her finger on the pulse, I mean, almost perfectly, really, so that we led the way. Now you're seeing other people creating ministries of blue economy. I think in the whole context of things, leadership is going to be so vitally important. Leadership, period. Whether it's leadership in the blue economy space, but national leadership, and there is no conversation I, I have about the blue economy, about the work we're doing in oceans without recognizing the work the Prime Minister personally has done in relation to being the driving force, not only for Barbados, but for the Caribbean, in the things that we're doing in the ocean. I mean, all of us, one way or the other, we're tied to the ocean, all of us. And if we do not have these serious conversations about the ocean now, then it's going to be the detriment of all of us in the end. And then, of course, we also have to stand. We can't shout at our lar larger neighbors in the north, but uh, we still have to be able to say to them very frontally that the things you are doing are having a deleterious effect on us. I mean, we could ban plastics so the cow come home. We could do all, we could go fossil fuel free until the cows come home. At the end of the day, if these larger nations don't change their ways and start doing things differently, then it will be to the detriment of every single one of us in this room, in Barbados and in the Caribbean. That is why, when people say that the conversations we are having on the regional scale, or when the Prime Minister speaks so strongly at these international meetings, and people don't get it, it troubles me because that is where we are at. We are at that point now where we need to have those very serious conversations about the state of the world and the state of the ocean, and the need for us to shift gears and to speak you know, without any kind of fear, speak truth to power. And I, I, I think that's where we are. And these things are going to be vitally important as we go forward. So I want to thank you too, Ian, for, for managing this entire process. I want to thank the team who came here and decided to stream us. I want to thank those who are viewing, you know, who stayed the course with us over the last hour and a half. And invite persons, it's going to be on our Facebook page or MMABE page the various activities that we have over the course of the next few days. And again, thank you all very much.